must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, F. Scott Feel, and as always, I'm joined by my co-hosts, Stephanie Wyrock and Brandon Pone. Today, we have Mark Milligan, CEO and founder of Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform for solving the problem of healthcare access by following any provider of any discipline remotely um, for their patients. He's also the creator of Revolution Human Health, which is a nonprofit physical therapy network that transforms the healing experience by offering access to treatment, education, and movement-based therapy for all. Mark, I know we've had you on the show before, uh, over about a year ago now, uh, talking about GSD and just getting shit done, um, and how to advocate for the profession. But today we wanted to chat about some of the new ventures that you've created since we've last had you on, but recognizing that some of the listeners may not have heard the first episode. Uh, if you haven't, I suggest you go check those both out because they're, they're phenomenal episodes. But um, if they don't know who you are, would you mind giving the listeners some background into uh, what you've been up to lately and your journey to, to the t- present time? Yeah, yeah, of course, F. Scott. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank you and, and Brandon and Stephanie for, for having me on the, the show again. I, um, I really appreciate all that you the three of you are doing for our profession and for really bringing people knowledge and information that they would not get otherwise. You guys have some phenomenal guests on the show, um, including people that are rarely interviewed for podcasts to bring information and to the people and to the students and to the professionals that, uh, that can make a big impact on the decision-making every day. So I appreciate you guys for having me on. So a few things that have been happening with me, it's been, it's been an awesome, a year, year and a half since I was on the HET uh, podcast. Um, uh, we progressed in a lot of different ways. So I've launched, well, let's, let's go back. So I'm a, I'm a physical therapist in Austin, Texas. Um, I wear a, a lot of different hats. So I still work full time in home health for uh, Encompass Home Health and, uh, and treat patients in memory care units and assisted living facilities. Um, I have a small concierge private practice, um, where we do a uh, fever service in people's homes. So we bring the best physical therapy to you. Um, and that actually, that's going to be relaunching in January um, with, a, with another fellow, another fellow named Nick Baderwolf, pretty hardcore in the Austin market for uh, for in-home um, physical therapy. And then I'm still working on legislative issues here in the state of Texas as the immediate past chair of the uh, the, the, the um, capital area district here in Austin. Uh, we, we're about to go into legislative session with uh, for our direct access here in Texas that we're still limited to or that we don't have. Um, so hopefully we can we can talk about that at a later date. Um, but other than that, I've just been focused on teaching across the country, and then the the Anywhere Healthcare platform to help connect providers and patients. And then um, uh, in January again, uh, going to be back at it with the YMCA with Revolution Human Health, the nonprofit that I have. So just so, you know, as as we all are in this business, we have a lot of we have a lot of stuff going on, and and a lot of things to to get done, as we say to get it done. You know, I really appreciate a, all the stuff that you've done for the profession, because it's interesting because I'm like, if there's anything, if there's a lot of awesome avenues that are happening in the profession, like I'm pretty sure Mark Milligan is somewhere shaping, somewhere involved in some way. So I really appreciate all that you've done and for joining us today. And, you know, obviously talk today, kind of the topic of discussion is focusing on this one of these newer developments that you've had going on with Anywhere Healthcare, which is that telehealth platform. But, you know, let's back up a little bit and let's set the stage because I realize that some of our listeners may not specifically know 
what telehealth is. So, you know, just to kind of give some context here, what specifically is telehealth and why should telehealth be embraced in this day and age? Yeah, Brandon, those are great questions. Um, I think that telehealth is actually the ability and the utilization of technology to treat patients from a distance, right? So it could be, um, there's, I mean, you can look at it in many different ways, but the current adoption of what telehealth really is, is, is the utilization of video to communicate with patients. And so um, it's really, you can break it down into three or four categories. The first category is just live video, right? This is the most common in the form of telehealth out there. Um, it's just a face-to-face -face video conversation um, that you can see your patient live real time uh, through a video interface. And that's really the basic, uh, the biggest one that's out there. Um, another subset of telehealth is what's called store and forward information. So this is where it's, it is, or asynchronous is another term that's out there. Asynchronous um, uh, uh, visits are when you can actually push information that's not live. So this would be things like as simple as email or images or videos or, or HEP programs or um, other content that you would actually send to that patient that wasn't live with you at the same time. So another term for the live video is synchronous uh, uh, telehealth. So that's live, synchronous, same time, face-to-face -face information. Um, and then another popular thing that uh, PTs have seen, or I hope they have seen, is called remote patient monitoring. And remote patient monitoring um, is starting to be a very large part of the telehealth movement because it's the ability for people with a, a complex diagnosis to be at home, but to be monitored real time by a professional somewhere else. So this is really common in complex diagnoses, uh, such as uh, congestive heart failure and other post-operative high risk, uh, post-operative um, conditions that would most likely be monitored in the hospital, but can be monitored remotely at home. So um, in the physical therapy space, really the synchronous or the live visits or the asynchronous have really are going to be the space where we're going to be in most um, because it allows us real-time communication with patients or um, the ability to give that patient information that they need at a later date. Uh, and especially for us, like um, follow-up uh, information, uh, home exercise programs, um, home exercise videos, other things like that that can be part of their, their rehab process. Um, and so, and I think the important part about what's happening here with with, uh, with telehealth and how we need to embrace it, right? Because that was the follow-up question really is, is why should we look at this? It's, um, it's because the data shot is pretty overwhelming when it comes to looking at where physical therapy and the healthcare industry will be in the next 10 to 7 to 10 to 15 years. Um, there's a large, large push into telehealth or virtual visits um, for a lot of different reasons. And the biggest reason right now is just cost savings. Um, it, it really, from a, from, a, from a metric standpoint, looking at how much it costs to employ and deliver care virtually um, is less. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? You don't have to have any overhead. You, you can do, most of this can be done from a building or um, an offsite location where you don't actually have to pay rent or, or, or you can, as a small private practice owner, you can, you can perform this from your home wherever, uh, and you don't have to have an office. Um, and so there's a lot of different benefits um, to, to utilizing virtual care in your practice. Um, I think we need to look at a, a few of the different paradigms. So when it comes to telehealth, there's a few things you can look at. One, you can start small and just be a small private practice owner, right? Let's imagine just that you're an N of one. You, you're a private practice owner. You've got an outpatient orthopedic clinic, um, and, you, and you can utilize and leverage telehealth in that practice in many different ways. And then you can scale that and change it depending on the size of the practice you have. So I think the, the current data looks at about 50% of all healthcare delivery is going to be virtual within the next seven to 10 years. And the reason that we need to adopt it is if, if we don't start adopting this as a profession, um, we're gonna get left behind. And um, with the licensure compact coming on, on online pretty soon in, in, in other states, Texas coming on hopefully in, in January of 2019, um, there's going to be some interesting market space uh, looking at uh, national physical therapy networks and other endeavors uh, to, create, to create access to healthcare and access to physical therapy.
Yeah, I think that you make a really good point, Mark, that we need to make sure that we're up to date on this and up to speed on telehealth. Otherwise, um, we will be left behind. What are some of the pros and cons um, surrounding telehealth? Yeah, so some of the let's start with the pros because that's always the easiest. One, one, it's you can have actually so one from a provider side, um, you can have you can leverage telehealth to be part of your entire patient experience, right? So you can actually create a different model of care where a patient has access to you and to your services um, like there's been no, like in, in no other time in history, right? You can actually leverage a telehealth um, in a, as a small private practice owner or a private practice owner. Um, you can leverage telehealth in many different ways. One, you could do, uh, let's do it instead of a free phone call or, or a first touch being a phone call, you could actually have a first telehealth visit to make sure that, that patient is excited and ready to be in your practice, right? So you can you can use this as a, almost a free screen or some type of, of, of ability for that patient to, to see you live and you talk to them live to make sure that they're appropriate and needed to be in your in your in your practice. So when they get there, you can really you, they can really just go straight into care. Um, secondly, you can have a practice that's all that's all virtual, right? There's a few uh, companies out there that are launching virtual physical therapy practice, physical therapy practices. So um, the pro is that there's there's going to be an entire marketplace for physical therapists that can work remotely um, from their home and leverage a very flexible schedule. If they have to take care of their children or have another job or have a side hustle like we all do, right? Um, they can utilize that as as part of that as as part of that type of growth for themselves as well. Um, you can also uh, just think about the implications in the Northeast. I think Brandon and I we talked about this. Could you imagine if you have a bad snow, you can flip everybody to a telehealth visit instead of having a a, a row of cancellations that day or closing the clinic. So there's actually some some business metrics that can be improved um, with with telehealth and leveraging that as well. Um, and then the continued touches for a patient, right? Instead of discharging a patient, hey, let's let's go ahead and, and follow up in six months or six weeks with a telehealth touch and just and see how you're doing with your exercise program. See if I can do anything to help you. See if we can then tweak your program. And then it's a 10 or 15 minute visit. You don't charge the patient, but you have that continued touch with that patient throughout their course of care in their life to make sure that they're doing well. And if they're not doing well, you get them back in the clinic. So it's a, it's a way to continue to, continue to touch a patient. And keep them uh, in the loop with what you're doing and your services and how they're doing with their with their return to their activities. Um, so those are some of the large um, benefits. It's really it's a time saver. It can be a it can be a clinic practice enhancer. It can be a continued patient touch point throughout their course of care and after their course of care. Um, so lots of ways to to really leverage this in your clinic system. Um, some of the cons some of the cons of telehealth. The biggest one is that you don't have your physical touch, right? You 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 don't have the the physical interaction of a physical therapy visit, which a lot of people expect. So knowing your patients and knowing your patient demographics, some people may respond to this very well. Some people may look at it like it's the technological devil, right? <laughs> like they don't ever want to have just a virtual visit. It's not something that they that they want to do. Um, so you have to really judge your patient population well and uh, and see who will adopt it and see who won't. Um, another con of uh, telehealth is which is which is um, there's a study published just this past week uh, about remote patient monitoring and patients with congestive heart failure and they actually saw an increase in utilization of VR visits. So um, sometimes information and continued touch can drive uh, healthcare utilization. And so um, if you have an easy access point like telehealth, uh, it could all, it could drive up utilization and, and costs for, for consumers. So that, that's something to consider uh, in, in a world where uh, healthcare is already over, overutilized. Um, and then the, another con of telehealth is you have to you have to make sure that you're protecting your data and that you're using appropriate uh, means of communication. Uh, a lot of professionals use or just default to the other video platforms that are easily like, easily available in their life, like FaceTime um, and uh, and Skype and and Google Chats, um, and none of those are HIPAA compliant. So you have to be mindful of making sure that you protect your patient's uh, safety and data, um, and utilize platforms that have been built in order to to really um, 
to maximize safety to make sure that your patients aren't, uh, your, their, their information is not compromised. I think you did a really good job of hitting all of them, Mark, and I, th I think that kind of leads me perfectly into my next question. What are some of the platforms that have been born or made specifically uh, for HIPAA compliance that uh, people are using currently for telehealth? Well, so that's a great question too, Scott, because there's there's a whole lot of different things out there. Um, and so there's what I consider to be platforms that are specific for healthcare, and then there's platforms that are communication that you can add some HIPAA compliance to it. But there's also, I think, a difference in companies that provide telehealth PT, and then there's video platforms that allow you to provide telehealth PT. So there's two distinct, I think, categories in this um, that, that we should talk about. Because one, there's companies out there that may be hiring that actually need physical therapists to provide their care virtually. And I think that that's a, a fair topic of conversation for those listening who, as you know, the HET has got a lot of side hustle kids that listen to it, right? So um, there's virtualphysicaltherapist.com, there's azera.com, there's theron.com, everflex.com, theranow.com um, that all actually provide, and I think um, uh, in hand health is another one that also they actually provide care um, via physical therapists across the country or in different locations in different pockets. And now that I'm sure there's several other smaller ones out there that, that those are the biggest ones that are on the, on the radar. Um, you also have uh, another, I mean, I can't talk about telehealth and physical therapy space without a shout out to Rob Bining and Anthony Maritato. Those two have also been um, just really pushing content and, and Elizabeth Fund. Um, those have all, they've all been pushing content into the space and, and also pushing platforms. I know Rob Finding has ptlive.me, which is a, a bear, it's like a hybrid of text telehealth scheduling, insurance verification, um, some hybrid clinic telehealth. So he's got that going on. Um, and he also has a PT funnels page that, uh, that allows people to kind of funnel into your clinic, um, from uh, a telehealth standpoint. So there's those two different kind of options. There's two those two two different options, and then you get into just standalone video platforms. Um, so I know we all have we've heard of Skype. It's free, but it's not HIPAA compliant. So let me back up. When it comes to HIPAA compliance, and when it comes to your practice, there's an argument that some people make that you uh, that you if you're not a HIPAA provider that you should that you don't have to have a HIPAA compliant platform. And um, I think we need to, to, to dispel that myth that even though you're not a HIPAA compliant provider, that you don't have to follow HIPAA because you're an out of network cash based practice, you still have to utilize best practices to keep your patient's data secure and safe. And, and if you have to go through all reasonable means and necessary exploration of the available uh, systems that can keep your patient's data as safe as possible. So even if you're not a HIPAA compliant provider, or you say you're not a HIPAA compliant provider, you still have to go by best practices to use the most secure way to transmit and transform your patient's data regardless. And so everybody in the healthcare space, if they're transmitting patient, say, patient data and patient information, you should be using a HIPAA compliant platform. And so that's why Skype, FaceTime, uh, and um, and uh, Google Meet or Google Hangouts are all non-HIPAA compliant, so they shouldn't be used in any patient care um, because there's options that are that are free that you just have to discover, right? So um, so it depends on which way you go. So Zoom has a has a HIPAA uh, a HIPAA compliant, which is about two hundred dollars a month. CoView uh, CoView has a free monthly, but then it costs more per month. DoxyMe has a, a free platform that you can use. They give you a meeting link, and then you can send that to patients. But then if you want more features, it costs more per month. Um, Clocktree is another one that's free for about 10 hours. But then if you see more than that per month, it costs more money. There's uh, VC, um, which is another, again, more expensive per month for a HIPAA compliant uh, platform. Uh, physio.com, P-H-Y-Z-I-O.com is free for 30 days, but then it costs a lot of pretty, a decent amount per month and then a buck, a two bucks a visit. Um, and then there's the platform that I created called anywhere.healthcare, um, which is a HIPAA compliant platform that has texting, messaging, scheduling, um, and, and patient facing iOS and Android apps for 39 bucks a month, unlimited use. So there's a lot of different options out there. Um, 
but you have to do your due diligence to see what platform works best for you. Some of them are plug and play. Some of them um, allow you to just send a video link out that send that that links the patient to a to a room to a a, a, a private treatment video. Um, others are more of an integration into your clinical practice. Um, so it's really you, I, I encourage most of them give a free trial. Um, so you should try that free trial to see if it makes sense within your clinical practice and your framework of how you're going to do business. Yeah, Mark, and that's really, really helpful just to kind of gather the overall types of platforms that exist to utilize telehealth through. And obviously, you kind of mentioning that there's some specifics to each. And I realize that you kind of answered, you've definitely answered part of this earlier on. Um, but say, for example, someone's thinking that, all right, I want to start telehealth practice, or I want to incorporate it somehow into the clinic. What are, have that you've noticed from kind of these big and popular platforms that you had mentioned earlier, what are the big pros and cons specifically of these platforms to like help make someone maybe make a better decision on what avenue they want to go? Ooh, yeah, that's a great question, Brandon, because there's, I think the biggest question that I get from everybody is one, does it have an EHR? Like how do you document um, and as of now, there's really, um, there's really no EHR that has a HIPAA compliant video platform embedded into it. They just were built separately. And so as, as new EHRs are, are being built, they'll probably have some seamless. And then there's a few, um, I forget the name of it. There's one company that does massive video, uh, integration into businesses, but they work with, with, um, uh, with Cerner and with another large um, uh, EHR corporation, and it's a it's a hundreds of thousands of dollar integration. It's not realistic for physical therapists and especially small private practices. Um, so the biggest thing is about how we document and how and how you integrate that into your into your clinic system. So um, as of now, um, none of the ones that I spoke about actually has um, a way to document your patient care. And so that's an interesting, well, I take that back. So Anywhere Healthcare, the one that I created, comes with a HIPAA compliant G Suite. And so you could use that as your entire um, practice suite and keep your, if you're a small private practice or if you're a solo um, cash-based practitioner, you can use that as your HIPAA compliant um, uh, EHR and, and be your entire practice suite for 39 bucks a month. But after that, you have to figure out a way to, um, what's the easiest and how it functions with your, with your daily um, integration. Uh, not very many integrate. You have to think about also not many of these or if, if not, none of them integrate with your scheduling system. So you have to figure out a way to um, integrate their scheduling system in your, in your own scheduling system. So that could be a challenge. I know Rob Binding and PT Live is working on integration with scheduling. Um, so that would be one of the first ones. But none of the DoxyMe or the CoView or any of those people integrate with an outside scheduling system. Um, so that can be frustrating. And then the third most, con the biggest con for telehealth stuff is how you bill for it. Um, and I think that's an entire podcast in and of itself because billing is, is um, wildly variable and reimbursement is wildly variable uh, state by state. Um, some states, um, have parity laws where your in-person or your virtual visits are paid or mandatorily paid at the same rate as an in-person visit, um, and yet and but PTs aren't listed as a man as a provider in that mandatory parity law list. So um, you have to really be mindful and check out uh, your insurance by insurance. Just I've had people uh, when a new patient calls and they get their physical therapy benefits. Um, I'm encouraging people to get their telehealth uh, benefits as well um, because some states don't, don't, it doesn't even apply to PT. So you have to be really careful on how, um, if you're going to look to be reimbursed for this, how, how that's going to happen with your patient population. I know right now uh, we are not listed as a, an official provider of telehealth for Medicare. Um, and so Medicare uh, it's very challenging to get uh, reimbursed. It's, it's impossible to get reimbursed as physical therapist uh, if you're billing Medicare for for video, um, which is something that we need to address on a professional on a on a on a larger scale level. So those are probably the three biggest um, cons of of utilizing uh, video in your clinical practice right now. It's going to be the the billing or the um, the EHR integration or the utilization. I just most people just do the side by side. Um, and then your uh, your billing, 
and then your scheduling system. So I think those are those are some pretty big barriers, but most of most people are figuring out ways to to work around it. Um, but I encourage um, in a in a fee for service. I mean, and you also have to think about how you leverage this tele these platforms and video in and not get reimbursed for it. I think it's important to to know that some of these platforms, if you're only paying thirty nine bucks a month, or some of them are free, you need to look at how you utilize that in the patient experience. I'm stealing from Jerry Durham here, right? I mean, you have to see how you can leverage this technology for your entire patient experience, um, and and just eat it as a cost of the company, right? I mean, 39 bucks a month, if you put a plug up on your website to say, look, we get a, uh, you get a free telehealth visit, um, uh, a free intro telehealth visit that may get you two new patients a month. I mean, and the patient, and the patient uh, uh, value for your clinic could be a couple of thousand dollars. So I think that if you, if you look at not just looking at video and telehealth as a way to get paid, but it's a way to maximize the patient experience and maximize the patient uh, contact and touch point. This could be a this could be a, a tremendous value add for you as a provider for your patient. So a uh, different way to twist and think about how to how to leverage that and utilize it in your clinical practice. Yeah, Mark, and that certainly seems to make a lot of sense from the patient experience avenue. But I kind of want to ask one follow up to kind of one of the points you had mentioned on there earlier regarding reimbursement. And I know, you know, obviously with the insurance reimbursement kind of being the way it is now, do you think that it's better to honestly go more for insurance for reimbursement for telehealth or out of network? Yeah, that's a tough question, Brandon. So let's take, let's take Minnesota, for example. <clears throat> Minnesota has a parity law that all in-person visits are paid, the our virtual visits are paid the same as in-person visits. And that is required for all insurances within the state of Minnesota for every provider except a PT. So we're off the list. We just didn't make the list. I mean, uh, OTs made the list, STs made the list, but PTs didn't make the list in Minnesota. So for in Minnesota, um, there's you can't bill, you won't get paid for telehealth visits as a as a PT provider. So you can't, you just, you can't do it. Um, and in some states, you also need to make sure as a provider that telehealth is legal in your state for you. Right. There's there's some states that support telehealth robustly for a physical therapist and there's some states that don't support it at all. So um, you need to check not only in your state practice act to make sure that if there's language that's been written that it's um, and that you have it. But if it's not written, I mean, you can you can definitely play in that space and see and see what's available for you. Um, but there's a default kind of checklist. You need to make sure it's within your scope. You need to make sure that the patient is okay with it, then you need to make sure that um, however you feel that you are utilizing the platform or using telehealth, you get paid for it. Um, so in California, I know that um, an interesting model a couple of people are, are working with is, is in their Medicaid system of California, uh, CalMed. It's an interesting model there because physical therapists get reimbursed the same rate for uh, in-person and uh, virtual for their um, for their Medicaid program, which is actually an interesting way to, because the Medicaid reimbursement in California is so low that it actually makes sense for it to be a virtual practice. So you can actually increase your practice volume and make actual, you can make money doing Medicaid visits uh, via telehealth. Um, so just, Brandon, the, the question is so varied that right now you need to check insurance verifications for your patients to see if you can get paid by telehealth, but if not, um, I think either using it in a cash-based practice, a fee-for-service, or utilizing it as part of your ability to reach patients and get them into your clinic, and just use it as an not like in your advertising budget, would be a way that would be the three best ways to look at it. But you've got to do the research and do due diligence for your patients to make sure that they can that you can get reimbursed, and it varies every single state for every different plan. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. 
thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.